so yes, and what, I, I say I, all this not to I say all this not to diminish um, what Sam Bankman Fried did, but you know there are some differences, and you have to have some perspective about it. Back with us, the former U.S. prosecutor who took down Bernie Madoff, Mark Litt, back on Coinage. Mark, it's good to see you again. Hi, great to see you. Thanks. We've got, I mean, you and I were talking about the SBF defense before the trial. We talked right as the ruling came out, seven counts he was found guilty on. And now the sentencing memo, prosecutors looking for 40 to 50 years for SBF. I'm just kind of curious what your initial reaction after reading the sentencing memo was and what you make of what prosecutors are seeking here. Yeah, well, of course, uh, uh, Bankman Fried put in a memo looking for six or seven years. Uh, not at all surprising the government is seeking more. Um, as you know, the guidelines are considerably higher, um, 110 years, I think. Um, and I guess the most surprising thing to me about the government's submission is just that they are seeking or advocating for a particular range of 40 to 50 years. That's atypical in my experience. Usually uh, Southern District prosecutors advocate for the guidelines and they let the judge do the rest. Uh, and there's a simple reason for that, which is um, it's awfully tough as a prosecutor to calibrate a sentence exactly, keeping in mind all the other uh, cases that there are out there, and it's easier to just let the guidelines do the work. Because if you do that and leave it to the judge, then defense attorneys down the road can't come and say, well, in this case, you advocated for this number of months or years, and in this case, it was that, and my case is closer to this one or that one, and you get into all of this negotiation and rehashing of history mm -hmm. where the prosecutors involved have long since left the office and don't know the details of those cases and it just becomes a big mess it's yeah. much easier to let the guidelines do the work let the judges do the work and your advocacy tends to be around what the appropriate guidelines are in yeah. some cases prosecutors might say here are the guidelines. We think a sentence lower than the guidelines could meet the sentencing statute's objectives of, you know, the, the lowest sentence um, necessary to meet, you know, to provide for specific deterrence, general deterrence, nature and circumstances of the defendant and the crime and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but not advocate for a specific range. So this was a little unusual that the government actually chose a range. But I think, you know, one of the main things in terms of where maybe Sam's defense team is saying six and a half years would be fair versus the government saying 40 to 50 years is more just comes around this idea of victims and losses. And Sam's defense team seems to be saying, look, the FTX estate is saying that they're going to repay all the victims here and everyone's going to basically be made whole. I'm curious to get your take in terms of how the judge might look at that. Yeah, I, I don't think the judge is going to be swayed by that argument uh, too much. It's sort of like uh, it's not an exact analogy, but, you know, somebody tries to rob a bank um, but doesn't actually get away with any money. Um, have they committed bank robbery? Um, Somebody tries to steal a certain amount of money, uh, but they're thwarted. Their intent was to steal that amount of money. That's what the sentencing guidelines do. And, and it's important to you know, always be aware there are two things at play in any sentencing. There's what the guidelines say. The guidelines are a starting point. The guidelines are heavily loss dependent, whether it's actual loss or intended loss. Um, they drive the guidelines in a white collar case. And then there's really how a defendant gets sentenced, which is starting with the guidelines as a factor, which is supposed to be designed to make things equal across defendants and across the country and across judges so that there's some more uniformity than there would otherwise be. Mm -hmm. Then judges 
use their experience and knowledge and everything they know about the case and everything that's brought to their attention uh, about the person, the crime, the effects, and everything else to figure out what the fair sentence is in those circumstances that meets all those objectives of sentencing. Deterrence for that individual, deterrence generally, um, the nature of the offense, uh, the nature of the person. Yeah, what's interesting is that they actually make specific mention of Madoff. And of course, there's probably no one more attached to it than you were. Uh, in these comparisons, in the sentencing memo, they talked about uh, how Sam's defense team was trying to basically draw uh, a distinction from what happened in this case versus Madoff, saying it's not an app comparison because Madoff embezzled more money, engaged in fraud from the beginning, and was older and used millions of stolen funds for himself. I'm, I'm curious, when you and I spoke uh, before the trial, you were saying that it's not necessarily the same thing. It's not an outright Ponzi scheme here with what FTX and what Sam Bankman Freed perpetrated. But, I mean, what do you make of the exact comparisons in this sentencing memo and SBF's defense? Well, um, there had to be some comparison to Madoff, I guess, because it's a large scale financial fraud and it's the, the most compar comparable in some ways in that it's uh, in the public eye and it's large. Um, there are differences both between the individuals and between, and between the schemes. Uh, and so I guess comparison was inevitable. I mean, you know, look, the differences I see, uh, the key difference is Bankman Fried's age. That's the most important. Um, I mean, I look back at our sentencing memo uh, where we advocated for the guidelines or an alternative. The alternative was a sentence that would keep him incarcerated for the rest of his life and send a strong message of general deterrence to the world. And by putting it that way, we accomplished a couple of objectives. First of all, made it clear that we thought he was then, I think, on the around 70 years old, that he should not be coming out of jail. Second, we recognized implicitly in that that 150 years provided for by the guidelines was largely a symbolic sentence. And third, we didn't want to cap the sentencing judge. I mean, if we had gone in and said 35 years and Judge Chin had in his mind, he wanted to send a message to the world of 100 years or 150 years, well, two things would happen. First of all, we could open, we could have opened ourselves up to being excoriated by the judge uh, in open court. What is the government doing, you know, advocating for this? And you don't want to look ridiculous as a prosecutor. Um, and, uh, you know, second, it, it could constrain the court from doing what it thought best. And again, after all, that's the court's job as prosecutors. I can only speak for myself, but most prosecutors I've talked to don't particularly relish sentencing. Um, you know, sentencing is not the fun part of the job. The fun part of the job is figuring out what happened, gathering the evidence, charging the, the individuals that are responsible, and then prosecuting them, going to trial and convicting them. Yeah. Sentencing, while important uh, and time an effort goes into getting things right, it doesn't bring anybody uh, any kind of satisfaction, really. Sentencing is always a sad day. Even if you're a prosecutor who's worked for months to get to the point of convicting somebody um, and doing all the work that it takes to get there, you kind of go to a sentencing with a pit in your stomach and um, you tend to leave that way too. And the, you're just as happy to have the court take responsibility for making all of those finely calibrated decisions about where does this person stand with respect to that person and this crime and that crime. Let the judge figure it out. 
Yeah, in this in this area of deterrence too, I guess there is a unique piece of what happened at FTX, and it's mentioned in the memo that there's a need for deterrence, especially in the important area of cryptocurrency, where some individuals have operated under the misimpression that they are unregulated and not subject to criminal laws. I, I wonder how much of this is maybe potentially a, a message for the Justice Department to all of crypto as well. Uh, maybe. I don't, I, if I were a judge, I wouldn't be terribly responsive to that argument either, because just because you operate in an unregulated space, uh, you are subject to the criminal laws, um, courts, and judges, um, society count counts on that. So mm -hmm. a special message for crypto. Uh, I think that's really the government's uh, obligation. Let's just say that, I mean, how does this normally go, right? When we have the defense coming out and saying six and a half years, you've got now the government and prosecutors here saying 40 to 50. Uh, I mean, how does that, how is it expected to play out when we get to sentencing? As you said, it's not particularly something that's relished by prosecution, but how do you envision it going when that day comes? Well, I think there's going to be an argument about the guidelines and what what the guideline sentence is. The parties are very far apart. They're apart on all the enhancements, but most importantly, you know, the government pointed out all those sentencing enhancements are swallowed up by the difference in the loss amount. So I expect there to be an argument about loss amount and what the right figure is. And I expect the court will side with the government on that. Um, when it comes to, I guess, uh, the question of, I mean, we open this interview with the idea of what's fair here, right? And and I guess if we could take the Mark Litt who prosecuted Bernie Madoff and put you in the position of these prosecutors today, how, how would you have written this memo? What would you have sought? Well, as I said, I, I think I would have written it similar to uh, what we did in Madoff which is advocate for the guideline or a sentence below, we would have recognized in some way that a below guideline sentence uh, could be appropriate in this case, given his age, among other things. Um, and, but stress the need for the court to send a strong message of deterrence. Um, that's the way we handled it with Madoff. We didn't want to box in the judge into a range or even a number and that is in line with what was at least then standard DOJ slash SDNY policy. Now, look, the U.S. attorney had to approve this sentencing memo before it was filed. He, he certainly, if not the memo, he certainly approved uh, the, the, bon the bottom line request of 40 to 50 years. So I think uh they must have come to a decision that in light of a his age and b the interest and scope of the case that they had to do something different from what is usual what, what, uh, what do you mean by that exactly well because they specified a range of 40 to 50 years i mean that doesn't in my experience that doesn't happen it's not like TV shows where you either bargain over particular sentences or you advocate for a particular sentence. The prosecutors in the Southern District advocate for the guidelines. Sometimes they may say, we recognize the guidelines, a lower That's, sentence could right, be appropriate. 110 years are the guidelines, right? Just to be... Correct. Yeah. yeah. They advocate for the guidelines. They may acknowledge that a below guideline sentence would meet all the uh, criteria of the sentencing statutes, um, but they don't specify a particular sentence because not only are they, as I was talking about earlier, not only are they potentially boxing a judge in who may want to send a different message or think a different sentence is appropriate, and then they risk the ire of the court who they are back in front of tomorrow and the next day and next month. Um, or they risk the ire of the public and <laughs> public perception, or they risk setting themselves up to litigate <laughs> what the appropriate um, sentence to advocate for 
is in future cases when a defendant says, well, wait a minute, the government only asked for 40 to 50 years in this case. Why are they asking for 60 in, in my case? And my case is different in this way and that way. And, you know, prosecutors don't want to get into that in general. But I'm quite confident that they gave it a lot of thought um, and they understood the risks that I've just described, uh, judge facing, public facing, and down the line, defense counsel facing, hmm. and decide, balanced the risks and the message that they wanted to send and decided that this was an appropriate sentence to advocate for. But it's unusual. Just to quote the, the SBS defense here as well, I mean, they basically laid out and argued that the guidelines here are not based on empirical evidence and, quote, substantially overstate the seriousness of the offense. Um, I suspect you'll say that's not necessarily true, but, uh, I mean, what do you make of that? Because it does seem like it's the amount that is really the biggest piece of how you arrive at 110 years, or in this yeah. case, 40. Well, look, I personally think the guidelines do overstate the seriousness of the offense. I don't think uh, whatever you know he did deserves him spending the rest of his life in jail. He's 30, uh, in his early 30s, uh, that could be 60 years, 70 years. That's reserved for uh, violent criminals, um, I, I don't know of a financial fraud case. Um, there are very, I mean, I, I think there are some, I mean, I do know that I think there was one in Pennsylvania where somebody was sentenced to 200 years, but you know, that was a, a symbolic sentence. Um, look back to some of the, it's prompting me back to some of the differences from Madoff um, and similarities. Look, what Madoff did was over decades uh, this happened over, what, two years? Madoff was in his 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, when he did what he did. This guy's in his late 20s, early 30s. Madoff did, had effects on anonymous people all over the world. But a lot of what he did, he did to people that he knew, that he met with, that he lied to their faces about that he took Elie Wiesel's foundation's money in you know September or October of 2008. I mean, very personal, you know, almost like mugging somebody. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I'm aware, what Bankman Fried did was at a much more institutional, anonymous, if you will, level. Um, and another difference is, you know, nobody stood up and advocated for Bernie Madoff. No, he had no letters of support. Mm -hmm. Nobody came and spoke on his behalf at his sentencing. It was him. Yeah. At, at least Sam Bankman Fried had 10 or 11 people, his parents, others, who stepped forward and tried to paint a picture of the other side of who he is. Bernie Madoff had nobody. Zero. Yeah. Um, so, I and I say all this not to I say all this not to diminish um, what Sam Bankman Fried did, but you know there are some differences, and you have to have some perspective about it. Well, that's why I wonder because I wonder if it would be unjust, let's say that the sentencing guidelines do come down or, or that the sentencing is 50 years, like you said, that could potentially be a life sentence. Sam Bankman fried could spend the rest of his life in jail. Would that be unjust in your opinion? You know, uh, <clears throat> look, I think after reading, look, my mind changed a little bit after reading the government's submission. I was at sort of 20 to 30 years. Now I'm maybe in the 30 to 40 uh, or 25 to 35, somewhere in there. Um, half prediction, half what I think is appropriate, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's but it's not. I don't feel like I know enough about 
all, yeah. all that happened and his testimony and the degree to which he was untruthful and um look i mean judge kaplan i know is going to have very strong opinions about both bankman freed his conduct and what's appropriate in all the circumstances and i you know i i can't be a, a talking head of pining on 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 that kind of question on things where i i just don't have the data yeah. Well, I guess one thing that would be true, given that we talked about this before the trial even began, was this idea of, hey, potentially Judge Kaplan could put SBF in jail and, you know, basically detain him before the trial even begins. We didn't think that that necessarily was going to happen. It did happen. And I think yeah. at the trial, Judge Kaplan was irked uh, when SBF took the stand and wasn't exactly answering questions directly. Um I mean, it is the judge, right, at the end of the day, who's going to make this call. And I wonder if any of that, as we said before, SPF didn't do himself really any favors by testifying or, or having this case go to trial. Uh, and so I wonder when you put all that together, how much of this is a personal decision on the part of the judge? Well, it's all an entirely personal decision. I mean, not that he takes it personally. Yeah. He takes it in his institutional ro role, but nobody, uh, nobody else is going to sentence him. And the odds are very strong, I think, or very high that no sentence that he imposes is going to be overturned on appeal either. Mm -hmm. He will make a record to justify his sentence. And his sentence, I believe, will be below the guidelines. It's not going to be 110 years. I, I would be very surprised if Judge Kaplan imposed a 110-year sentence. I guess... Um, I would expect that he would want to uh, leave open the possibility for this young man to be able to emerge from prison and redeem himself in some way. I mean, we do as a society believe in rehabilitation and redemption as much as we talk a lot about and believe in punishment mm -hmm. as well. That's yeah. That's that's getting into the the deep the deepness of the justice system. I I, I presume there and and I guess you know we had talked before about co-conspirators as well and what position they're in. Uh, it sounded like you believe that the co-conspirators potentially for having you know testified the way they did to lead to SBF's conviction might actually not get any prison time at all. I'm curious if if seeing the sentencing memo changes or maybe gives you any more insight into kind of how the government might be looking at co-conspirators, given that, you know, 40 to 50 years is still a lot here for SBF. No. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so, because this is a very different sentencing memo than what I think might be applied to co-conspirators. Yeah. And in uh, for cooperators in general, the government does not advocate for a specific sentence or range. Mm -hmm. Maybe the government will surprise us again. But in general, um, the government writes what's called a 5K letter where it lays out all the cooperation and the value of the cooperation and um, urges the court to, um, you know, to uh, um, essentially throw the guidelines away. What do you make? There was also this other piece of the sentencing memo when it comes to forfeiture of assets and restitution. I don't know if you if you read too deeply into that, but this idea that SBF himself, uh, on top of what's potentially coming back to victims via the FTX estate and bankruptcy, it does seem like there's a huge difference between the defense and the prosecution in looking kind of at how how hurt victims were in this case. Well, I think the government has an obligation to use the forfeiture laws to take all profit out of crime. And um, I think they saw that they have that obligation and they can't count on the activities of the receiver and, and what happens in the bankruptcy court to make victims whole and they have to do whatever they can to secure whatever assets there are out there and to secure a judgment against Bankman Freed through the criminal process um, that could then, to the extent there are recoveries, feed into the bankruptcy um, 
process. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's I'm, I think that's pretty much everything that I had to ask, to be honest with you. I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to add around kind of, I guess uh, it's weird, right? I mean, we've talked about this case for a, for months now. And it sounds like maybe there is a little bit of a change in terms of how you've looked at this case since we first started talking to kind of now where we are here on as we approach the sentencing to where before the parallels and the I guess the similarities were there front and center and now maybe not so much. Well, I, no, I don't think that's right. I mean, I always pointed out the differences from Madoff. I always saw differences. Um, there are always going to be some similarities, but no, I, I don't think it's, I don't think I've changed my view uh, very much. I think, you know, look, I think the most compelling part of the government's sentencing memo was the chart they provided of other sentences. Hmm. Now that that's a shorthand because all it has is a dollar amount. It doesn't really speak to the qualitative side of the conduct or whether the loss was quote unquote real and suffered and how much of it was suffered and how much of it uh, was mitigated by later being recouped, whether it's through forfeiture, restitution, bankruptcy or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, that that short. Um, that's kind of, by the way, that's a very good distinction because I almost feel like I understood it when Judge Kaplan was talking about the lottery ticket and basically you robbed a bank and bought a lottery ticket and you hit and so you return the money and so that doesn't mean that it's not fraud. And I get that when it comes to convicting someone. But when it comes to the sentencing guidelines and the idea of now you might actually have the victims recouping the losses, and I understand they still had to go two years to get their money back or whatever, but when it comes to the guidelines in that sense, these are two very different conversations, are they not? They are. And it's tough because look, look what happened in Madoff. In Madoff, I looked at the, our, our sentencing memo today. We said the known loss at that point or was 13 billion. You know, it turned out to be 17 or 17 and a half of fresh money that went into the Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. So that number was off at the time of sentencing. And then at that time, not a whole lot was known about how much was going to be recovered by the civic trustee or by the U.S. Attorney's Office through forfeiture, like the seven and a half billion dollars or seven point two billion from Jeffrey Pickauer. I don't think any we knew about any of that at the time of sentencing. Mm -hmm. Now we're down the road, and as was pointed out in the the sentencing briefs in this case, now. Uh, Madoff victims are, are set to get 91% of what they invested back. Mm -hmm. Now, 2009 to today, that's 15 years ago. So he was sentenced 15 years ago when the loss amount was thought to be 13 billion. You know, a year later, it would have been 17 and a half billion. And 15 years later, the actual loss would be, you know, nine percent of that yeah so it's the problem you know there's a timing problem associated with sentencing you only know what you know at the time and you don't get to revisit it down the road um but people get awfully caught up in the numbers because that's what the guidelines demand mm -hmm. and they get caught up in the numbers because that's what the headlines are about um, but really, I think to a sentencing judge, it's as much about the qualitative nature of the criminal conduct, because that's, after all, what they're supposed to be sentencing on. You know, what did the person actually do? What was the harm that was actually suffered of all kinds, psychological, monetary, physical, you name it. Um, and who is this person? Who is this person when they did the crime? Who is this person when they pled guilty or are standing in front of me after trial? Who are they at the time of sentencing? And who do I project them to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? And a judge has to take 
all of that into account and come up with an appropriate sentence. But it's not, I don't think it is, as a matter of fact, all wrapped up in figuring out what that number is, which the guidelines require. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really about a lot of qualitative things that a judge has to weigh and balance in coming up with an appropriate sentence. Yeah, it was actually in that mention of the 91% recovery that they said, uh, basically, the defense talking about that doesn't apply, uh, the prosecution saying, but doesn't mean that the loss amount calculated at Madoff sentencing in 2009 was incorrect, or that the court in the case should have attempted to predict how much money victims would ultimately be able to recover. And I feel like that's also very much at play here, where no one really knows what the recovery is going to be. FTX is saying that it might be a full recovery, right. um, but and what, makes- and what if that turns out to be wrong? You know, There's but somebody's reason. somebody's life, but somebody's life uh, and liberty shouldn't be, um, you know, at risk over those kind of projections. What yeah. what is known, what is known to the court, is what was the conduct. What were the misrepresentations that were made? What were the deceptive acts that were undertaken? Um, What, you know, they know some things. I mean, the the judge knows about the $100 million bribe. I mean, that's an astronomical bribe in and of itself. I didn't look at the guidelines to see what the guidelines would be just for that. But I suspect Judge Kaplan will tell us at the sentencing in partial justification of his sentence. You know, you don't have to get to um, the billions to get to a 20 or 30 or 40 year sentence. You just don't. And there's plenty of conduct along the way and plenty of intended loss uh, or relevant dollar figure uh, figures to take into account that are astronomical enough that the court can choose anything from zero or six and a half to 110. Mm -hmm. It can all be justified. You don't, you know, it doesn't, whether it was offshore, whether it was sophisticated means, whether you get this enhancement, that enhancement, none of that, none of that matters beyond the procedural necessity of accurately calculating what the guidelines are, because there's a statute that says a judge has to do it and the judge will do it. But as I said, as I was saying, it's really about the quality of the conduct Mm -hmm. and the qualities of the person that that are going to drive this and not predictions about recoveries or how much, how many cents on the dollar, the average, uh, investor actually may wind up losing seven years from now or 15 years from now when they're 91 percent done with figuring it all out yeah and i guess that is one of the key distinctions there in terms of it being kind of i guess you know you mentioned the investors who were hurt in this but then also i guess the retail consumers who may have had their money in ftx and didn't expect it to go down and there were certainly uh, mentions of those letters from victims in the sentencing memo as well people saying yep. that kid now Money for years. So, I mean, there is elements of that and it's going to be complicated. But I mean, like you said, all of this is going to be weighed by Judge Kaplan and we'll be watching to see uh, what happens when the sentencing comes out. Um, but Marklet, I appreciate it as always you weighing in on this and, and giving us your expert opinion and we'll see what happens. But thank you again for joining right. us. Happy to do it. Thanks.